I am not going to recapitulate the argument in my book, so this is a quick um, moment of advertising which we will pass quickly by. Um, and I want to start by, this is an illustration from Leonard Diggs's prognostication of the 1550s, and it shows the relative size of celestial bodies. At the top you have the sun, Below, beneath it you have Jupiter, between the two, on the left and the right, the same size, Earth and Mars. So the Sun, I mean, if you think in volume terms, maybe the Sun is four or five times the size of Jupiter. It's maybe a hundred times the size of the Earth. Newton gets round to thinking, I think in the third edition of the Principia, I think the figure is that the mass of the Sun is 160,000 times the mass of the Earth. Someone here surely knows what the correct difference is. It's presumably much larger even than, than that. The sense of scale between the 1540s and the 16, third edition of Principia, the 1710s, uh, is enormous transformation. And, and that's one of the things we, we need to bear in mind. But I want to start properly with Copernicus. And this is Copernicus's own manuscript of the De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, as it is known. Uh, Copernicus, Copernicus's disciple went around crossing out that title on all the copies he could get hold of. And it doesn't exist in Copernicus's own handwriting. So we don't know what Copernicus wanted to call the book, but not that, apparently. Possibly because he didn't actually believe that there were heavenly orbs, something we will come on to in a moment. Copernicus's system, unlike Ptolemy's system, which was centered on the Earth and had all the planets going round the Earth, and the Moon was there for a planet, and the Sun was there for a planet, and they all rotated around the Earth. I'm, going to, I'm trying to avoid using the word orbit because the word orbit is invented by Kepler. They all rotated around the Earth. Copernicus's system places the Sun at the center turns the Earth into a planet and has exceptionally the Moon going around the Earth instead of around the Sun. You can see, no, it's not drawn on there. It's written into the text there that the Moon is going around the Earth. And of course, it's an anomaly. Everything ought to be going around one central point. The crucial thing that Copernicus achieves by this transformation is he eliminates a whole set of epicycles from the Ptolemaic system because the movement of the Earth around the Sun replaces the epi epicycles that Ptolemy had had to introduce to get the relative positions of planets in the sky correct. So Copernicus's system is mathematically simpler. And everybody who reads Copernicus after 1543 is enormously impressed by Copernicus's mathematical achievement. And they go on to produce calculations of the movements of the heavenly bodies based upon Copernicus's principles. And if you read Thomas Kuhn's Copernican Revolution, which came out in, what, uh, 1956, I think, if you read Thomas Kuhn's great book, he will tell you that this shows that Copernicanism was establishing itself as the fundamental astronomical theory towards the end of the 16th century. Knowledge advances. And one thing we have absolutely, I say we, I, 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 wish it was, I wish I had something to contribute to this. One thing that has been established over the last 50 years since Kuhn's work is that Copernicus was not accepted in the late 16th century. That there was virtually, there are virtually no Copernicans to be found in the years before 1610, which is sort of my next reference date. How many Copernicans are there in the 1590s? Two or three. How many Copernicans are there in the 16 zeros? Two or three. There are lots of people commenting on Copernicus, and we know exactly what they're doing because we have the manuscript, that we have the printed copies of Copernicus, and we have their manuscript entries in the margin. And Owen Gingrich has looked at every surviving printed copy of the first and second editions of Copernicus to find out how they read Copernicus. And the answer is, they did not believe that it was literally true that the Earth went round the Sun. They believed that it was mathematically useful to think in those terms. 
And that's what the preface to the published edition of Copernicus told them to believe was the case. Osiander had added a preface saying, this isn't true, it's simply an hypothesis, the hypothesis being a mathematical model. And treat it as a mathematical model, don't believe it. So one of the fundamental things about Copernicus is that although he believed it was literally true that the Earth goes around the sun, and although astronomers find him extremely interesting in the 50 or 60 years after his publication, hardly anyone believes that he's right in that respect. There is no Copernican revolution provoked by Copernicus. Second crucial thing to say about Copernicus is that there are a series of battles that he doesn't fight. I've just mentioned the possibility that he didn't like the title, or his disciple didn't like the title, the, revolution of the, the Revolutions of the Heavenly Orbs, because he didn't believe in heavenly orbs. He doesn't say whether he believes in them or not. Scholars fight with each other over whether he believed in them or not. It's actually quite difficult to tell whether he believed in them or not. He says about the question of the size of the universe, he says, I'm going to leave it to the philosophers to argue about whether the universe is finite or infinite. I'm not going to be able to tell you whether it's finite or infinite. So that it's perfectly straightforward to read Copernicus as presenting a picture of a bounded universe with a series of concentric spheres. And in that respect, you read him, even if you think he's literally true in claiming that the Earth goes around the sun, you read him as a development of classical astronomy. And that's fundamentally what he is. The Copernican revolution, in the first place, doesn't take place. But had people become Copernicans, they would still have been thinking in terms of circular movements within orbs, within a bounded universe. The big transition in astronomy comes after Copernicus. So that if we go through to a text that's very, very famous, has been for the, since the 16, 1940s, Thomas Diggs's perfect description of the celestial orbs, which he publishes in his father's prognostication, from which I took the illustration with which I began, in 1576, in a, the third edition of his father's prognostication. Diggs is famous for producing the first representation of an infinite universe. People had argued the possibility, Nicholas of Cusa, for example, that the universe was infinite, but nobody had tried as an astronomer to present what that might mean. Diggs is the first technically comp competent astronomer apparently to do this, and this is the first illustration which shows it. What does it show? Here, I think, people have been very casual. Great book by uh, Quare uh, on the emergence, of the, I kind of think, I'm losing the exact title, but the emergence of the idea of an infinite universe, which centers on this illustration. Look at this illustration, and what you see is the sun at the center of the universe. You see a series of spheres around the sun on which the planets are traveling. And you then see the stars extending out in, across, out over the edge of the page into infinite space. But there is no suggestion here that the sun is a star. There's no claim being made that you can regard the universe as infinite in the sense that it doesn't have a center. On the contrary, we're told by Diggs that the sun is the center of the universe. And we're told on the outside, it says, the orb of stars fixed infinitely up extendeth itself in altitude, spherically, and therefore immovable, the palace of felicity garnished with perpetual happiness. In other words, Diggs thinks there's an infinite orb of stars around, but the, the what we would call the solar system, even though it never calls, uses that phrase, but around the sun and the planets. But he does not think the sun is a star, and he does not think that the universe has no center. <coughs> so that it's infinite in that it's unbounded, but it is centered. And it is a divine creation in which the sphere of the stars is quite literally, he says, heaven. It's entirely within a theological framework. And Diggs doesn't have uh, a 
modern understanding of the relationship between the sun and the planets. For example, he thinks that the Earth is a dark star. He doesn't understand that it shines by reflected light. He assumes that it would be invisible if seen from space. The notion that all the planets shine by reflected light is one only established later by Galileo. So the whole understanding that Diggs has of the relationship between the sun and the planets is quite different from the one that comes into existence in the later years of the 17th century. 1588, Tycho Brahe publishes 10 years after, 12 years after Diggs's illustration, Tycho Brahe publishes his alternative to the Copernican system. And his alternative to the Copernican system is one which places the Earth back at the center of the universe, so it's stationary, so we don't have to worry about why it is that as the Earth travels through space, we're not swept away by the wind, or why it is when I drop a ball it doesn't fall backwards in space. Tycho Brahe restores a fixed Earth. He places the sun in orbit around the Earth, and he places the planets in orbit around the sun, and then a sphere of stars outside them. The important thing about the Tychonic system is that it is mathematically, geometrically identical to the Copernican system. Tycho becomes the better alternative to Copernicanism for most astronomers and for virtually every astronomer after 1616. He becomes the better alternative to the Copernican system because his mathematical results are exactly the same as Copernicus's. But he doesn't have to have a moving Earth, which appears to be physically impossible to most people. And his understanding of the scale of the universe is much more compatible with traditional understandings. We already had in the previous talk a discussion of parallax. On the Copernican system, if the Earth is going around the sun, which is clearly a long distance, there ought to be parallax shifts in the relative positions of the stars in the heavens. Nobody could measure those in the 16th, 17th centuries. The absence of parallax implied that the Earth wasn't going around the sun. Very powerful argument against the Copernican system, which the Tychonic system didn't have to face. My little history of astronomy. I'm coming now to the great Kepler, who publishes his new astronomy in 1607. And Kepler is the first person to escape from the conviction that movement in the heavens has to be circular movement. For Ptolemy, for Copernicus, for Tycho Brahe, all movement in the heavens has to be circular movement, almost all movement in the heavens, I've come back to the exception, has to be circular movement, and where, cir where one circle can't give you the right results, what you do is you create combinations of circles. You create epicycles on cycles. You create circles around uh, displaced centers and so forth. All movement has to be circular movement. Kepler sits down and does this illustration, which is for the orbit of Mars, which is the first attempt to show what circular combinations of circular movements, cycles and epicycles, actually would mean in terms of where Mars would travel through space. What's fundamental to what Kepler does is instead of treating astronomy as a series of mathematical models which predict the positions of bodies in the heavens, which Ptolemy had done, which Copernicus had done, which Tycho Brahe had done, what Kepler does is treat astronomy as a study of the physical movements of real bodies in space. Consequently, he says, where does Mars move? And he draws this illustration to show what happens if you combine Ptolemaic cycles and epicycles for the movement of Mars. And then he says, how could Mars move like that? Supposing you were navigating Mars through space, how would you know how to make those turns? Supposing some sort of force was acting on Mars, what force acting on Mars could possibly bring about that peculiar pattern of movement? 
capitalist is just not conceivable. We can't interpret that as a real process in space. So Kepler replaces that model with the claim that some force is acting on the planets like magnetism, a force that acts over a distance, that drives the planets through the heavens, that speeds them up and slows them down. And the result, he says, is that the orbits, the new word that he introduces to describe this physical phenomenon, the orbits of the planets are ellipses. They're no longer circles. Now, at first Kepler thinks that this is the only way of giving a perfect mathematical representation of the orbit of Mars and that alternative representations are mathematically inferior. He then wakes up and realizes that actually, mathematically, you can generate the results that he's generated with ellipses by combinations of circles. So why is his result superior to the traditional results? For one reason only, it's physically plausible. It's not just mathematically accurate, it's physically plausible because it involves a claim about possible real forces. He has no theory of gravity, so he doesn't, he's an entirely hypothetical <laughs> imaginary real forces, but real forces could bring about the sort of movements he's talking about. Kepler publishes the Astronomy Nova in 1607. He's a contemporary with a great astronomer, a man who's about to become a great astronomer, Galileo Galilei. Galileo corresponds with Kepler. Galileo uses Kepler. Galileo can't stand Kepler's works. Galileo seems never to have read the Astronomia Nova properly, perhaps never to have read it at all. He says that when he tries to read Kepler, he gives up in despair. It's the most extraordinary example of two great intellects, one of whom can understand the other. Kepler understands Galileo pretty well, I think. Galileo does not understand Kepler at all. There's no sign that Galileo ever grasps the advantages of having elliptical orbits of the <coughs> planets in the heavens. As far as we can tell, Galileo throughout his life continues to believe in circular movement in the heavens. But Galileo has something that Kepler doesn't have. And we've already heard about that in the earlier talk a bit. Galileo has the telescope. The telescope was invented in 1608. You get a telescope, you start pointing it at things pointed at anything you can see, Galileo is the very first person to say, can I make a really powerful telescope? Initial primary use of telescopes is for military purposes. Cannon far about a mile. What you want to see is what's happening a mile off, so you can aim your cannon better. See, the horizon's about eight miles away. What do you want to see is something that's eight miles away. There's no point in seeing anything further than that. It's over the horizon. Galileo sets out to build a powerful telescope, and he succeeds within a few months. Why? He's looking for something in the heavens. He believes there's something to be seen. I think the answer is that he's looking for mountains on the moon. Plutarch had said there were mountains on the moon. First thing he does is look for mountains on the moon, and he finds them. Publishes the Starry Messenger in the spring of 1610, in which he says there are mountains on the moon. He says Jupiter has stars that travel around it. He doesn't call them moons. He doesn't call them moons because moon is proper name within the Ptolemaic system for uh, one of the planets that go around the Earth. Kepler comes along later and invents the word satellites for them. He says they're satellites of Jupiter. The moons of Jupiter only become moons of Jupiter, I think, in the late 17th century when moon becomes a generic term for the first time. Jupiter, he says, has moons. That makes it much easier to understand the anomaly of the Copernican system in which the moon goes around the Earth. If there are also moons going around Jupiter, it means the movements of the heavens are not centered entirely upon the sun. Starry Messenger makes an enormous impact. People like Kepler immediately try and get hold of telescopes, try and make their own. Kepler doesn't succeed, has to get one that's been made by Galileo. Confirm Galileo's results. Big Bang. Galileo's famous. That winter, Galileo starts looking through his telescope at Venus. He's assuming that Venus shines by reflected light. 
which is a minority view at the time. But if Venus shines by reflected light, and the reason he's assuming this is because he's shown that the moon shines by reflected light, and that the fact that the moon doesn't appear to is partly because the moon is illuminated by Earth's shine. So Galileo thinks heavenly bodies other than the sun and the stars shine by reflected light. If Venus shines by reflected light, then Venus will have phases, like the moon. Now, Ptolemaic astronomy had been unable to decide the relative position of Venus and the sun in the sky. Some people thought that Venus was further away from the Earth than the sun. Some people thought that Venus was closer to the Earth than the sun. But it was one or the other in a Ptolemaic system where there were fixed orbs which were solid. Consequently, if Venus shows phases, they must be of one of two sorts. If Venus is closer to the Earth than the Sun, the phases of Venus will go from half to crescent. And if Venus is further from the Earth than the Sun, the phases of Venus will go from half to full. If Venus is in orbit around the Sun, as Kepler, as um, Copernicus had claimed, then it will show a complete set of phases from crescent to full. In the winter of 1610, Galileo sees the phases of Venus, but crucially what he sees is Venus's phase is moving from less than half to more than half. At that moment, he's got proof that Venus is in orbit around the sun. And proof, therefore, that the Ptolemaic system is simply false. He's the only person who's seen it. He announces it in a letter to Kepler, which Kepler publishes it, announces it in a letter to Rome, to Christopher Clavius, the great Jesuit astronomer. The next April, the phenomenon recurs. The Jesuits have their telescopes trained on Venus, and they see it too. And from that moment, Ptolemaic astronomy is dead. Traditional astronomy, inherited from the Greeks and the Romans, cannot account for the phases of Venus. And you can see very simply that people stopped publishing the textbooks that they published right through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, which had been Ptolemaic textbooks, and which they're still publishing uninterruptedly right up until 1612, because Ptolemy is still what's taught in the universities everywhere. After 1612, it's no longer the case. After 1612, there are two competing systems available, the system of Copernicus and the system of Tycho Brahe, and Ptolemy is dead, and Galileo has killed him. And he's killed him so decisively that he doesn't really bother to publish this. The Jesuits know about it. Kepler publishes it. Galileo mentions it in a postscript to a discussion of sunspots. This illustration, which is Galileo's first illustration showing it, clearly comes out in 1623 in the Assayer. He doesn't need to publish it because word spreads like wildfire. It's such an important discovery. It hardly needs to be put in print at all. Everybody who hears about it understands what its consequences are. Around the same time, Galileo discovers sunspots. This is the point at which the sun becomes, for the first time, an object of scientific inquiry in itself. The telescope enables you, I'm sorry to say, initially what Galileo is doing is he's looking at the sun through his telescope, not something that you should be doing at all. And what he sees on it are spots. And initially it's clear he does not know what to make of them. And so he keeps them pretty much to himself, and by the winter of 1612, he's talking to people about them. Harriet, yeah, these are Harriet's. In 1610, the winter of 1610, is also drawing sunspots. He's seen them with his telescope. The first person to publish is Shiner. This is not Shiner's first publication, but it's from his later publication, Representations of Sunspots. So a quarrel breaks out about who's seen them first between Galileo and Shiner. Harriet keeps out of it because Harriet never publishes. Harriet is 
Harriet also discovers Galileo's law of projectiles. Harriet also discovers uh, Snell's law of refraction. Harriet discovers extraordinary things, but I guess he never publishes. He has no influence on the future course of science. But China publishes and Galileo publishes, and they fight about who comes first. But they also fight about what it is that they're seeing. And what Galileo does is he demonstrates very beautifully that as sunspots move around the sun, their shape alters when they reach the margin of the sun in such a way that they must be on the surface of the sun or very close. He says they might be like clouds around the Earth. They have to be right on close to the surface. China wanted to argue that they were satellites in orbit around the sun in some sort of complicated pattern and bounce, forming little clouds as they coalesced in various ways. Galileo says, no, no, they're absolutely on the surface, quite correctly. So this is the moment when it becomes possible to actually study the sun. And the technique they devised for doing this and that they all start using is to use a telescope to project an image of the sun onto a piece of paper you pre-draw circles on the piece of paper, and then you can get these really wonderfully precise drawings that Galileo is producing and that Harriet is producing and that Shiner is producing. These are, as it were, really amongst the first beautifully precise scientific illustrations that have been done there, attempt to, to achieve what photography later achieves, accurate representations of images. discussion in the talk before of when does the sun become a star and what I've tried to stress is that Coper for Copernicus the sun isn't a star that for Diggs the sun isn't a star for Tycho Brahe the sun isn't a star for Kepler the sun isn't a star first person after Aristarchus who clearly does think the sun is a star First person to build a inverted commas scientific, and Bruno, of course, who thinks the sun is a star but has no evidence to support it and no, no, and nothing beyond a philosophical claim that the universe is infinite and therefore it has to be uncentered. He understands that infinity, unlike Diggs, that you, if this universe is infinite, it has no center. Diggs fails to grasp this rather basic point. Um, first person to really build a cosmology around the notion that the sun is a star is Descartes. And this is Descartes' image of a universe, a cosmos, with a series of sun stars. So there's label S, it's I think indeed for the sun itself, and around it you see these circles, and the circles are uh, vortices in fluid material universe. You break up deck up leaves, there's no possibility of empty space. Everything is full of invisible fluids. Gravity is the result of vortices pressing us down towards the center. The planets are carried around in vortices. What you can see here, if you imagine an apple, the bottom example, what you're doing is you're looking down at the core of the apple. There's the sun in the center. There are the vortices around it. Uh, the example above it, labelled with a little F labelling it, it's like looking at the apple from the side. You can see the vortices going round uh, in the other direction, 90 degrees. But it's exactly the same process seen from the other angle. So what you have is a series of solar systems in which each sun has planets around it. And our planet and our sun are just one amongst infinitely many and consequently, we are insignificant in some important sense. Descartes says it's clear the universe wasn't built for us. Absolutely against what Genesis is all about. The universe isn't built for us. Whatever it's for, it's not for us. Extraordinary claim to make. Extraordinary claim to make, particularly so much of Descartes' work is designed to prove the existence of God and so forth. It's not made for us. The strange worm-like track you see going across that picture is the path of a comet. Descartes thinks that comets bounce off the outsides of the whirlpools and travel from one solar system to another 
appearing briefly in the margins of the solar system and then disappearing again. It helps explain why comets are temporary appearances. So Descartes' 1640s. Let's take the situation in, in 1650. 1651, exactly. And this is a textbook, or more than a textbook, a great study produced by Riccioli, a Jesuit astronomer, on the different competing systems of the universe. Galileo had published on that in the 1630s. This is Riccioli's response in 1651. And the first thing to see is that in the bottom right-hand corner, the Ptolemaic system has been thrown away. It's dead. Ptolemy himself is slumped on a couch at the back. He's fainting away. He's useless. Competition is between the system of Tycho Brahe on the right and the Copernican system on the left, which are being weighed in a balance. Now, when you weigh something in a balance, the heavier one goes down. And by and large, with most things, heaviness is good. It means you're getting more of something. So Riccioli says the Tychonic system is the one that weighs more heavily in the balance. That's the one you want to go for. That's the right system. The Copernican system is really worth taking seriously and thinking about, but it's not as good. Why is it not as good? Well, one reason is that it requires a moving Earth, and that's people had tried to drop objects from high buildings and measure whether they fell perpendicularly directly below or whether they fell behind, which actually they do slightly, but they couldn't succeed in measuring it until the 18th century. They couldn't measure this. They couldn't ma measure the parallax of the stars. But crucially in many ways, when they looked through a telescope, the stars are disks. You're using a telescope with a small aperture. What you see is little disks. And then if you say, well, how big is this little disk? The stars have to be very far away in the Copernican system because of the absence of parallax. The parallax has to be unme unmeasurable, so stars have to be very far away. On the other hand, they have a measurable size. So you then say, well, how big is this star to look this big when it's that far away? And the answer is, it turns out it has to be enormous. Riccioli's calculation is that the average star has to be so big that the whole of the orbit of Saturn would be within it. He says, if you're prepared to believe that, that's amazing because I'm not. Riccioli says it's implausible that stars are that big. And if they were, after the end, you know, they clearly wouldn't, they'd be different from the sun. They wouldn't be the same sort of object as the sun at all. Consequently, the Copernican system doesn't work. It's not until the 19th century that you get an explanation of why stars look like disks through the telescope, the airy disk, which explains why they're not pinpoints of light in a telescope but are little disks, and therefore an explanation of why they appear to be much bigger than they really are. Galileo knows there's a problem here. He just, Galileo's great at ignoring problems when he wants to, and he just ignores this problem. Riccioli says this is a decisive problem. This is the frontispiece to a work on comets by the great astronomer Johannes Hevelius, which comes out, I think, in 15, uh, 1677. And I want to talk for a moment about comets. We've seen that, as far as uh, Descartes is concerned, comets travel from solar system to solar system. So they are permanent objects, which we can only see temporarily when they happen to pass by in the way that I might see an aeroplane flying overhead, and I'll never see that aeroplane again. When Hevelius is writing in the 1670s, there are three competing accounts of comets. Tycho Brahe had set out to argue that comets move in circles around the sun. He wanted to make them like planets. He said, oh, well, the circles aren't perfect because comets are pretty imperfect, and comets exist only temporarily, so they disappear because they go fat and they're no longer there. But basically, it must be some form of circular movement. So on the left, you've got the Tychonic 
notion of a comet traveling in a circle around the sun. Kepler had said, no, no, comets travel in straight lines. They come into existence and they go out of existence, which is why they disappear. But they're traveling in straight lines. They are, as it were, bullets fired through space. You want me to stop very soon, and I will. Good. Um, Hevelius says, comets, as they pass the sun, are curved around the sun. They move in a parabola. But he assumes they're temporary bodies. And it's not till Newton's Principia, this is an illustration from the first edition, that Newton is the first person to take the comet as obeying the same laws of movement as the planets, as having a path around the sun, which is that of a conic section, just like the planets do, and that is therefore reducible to the same principles as the movement of the planets. Newton doesn't dare claim that com comets are permanent bodies, and the first person to claim that he can predict the return of a comet because this Newtonian orbit will come round on itself and bring about a return is Halley in 1705, when Halley predicts that the comet of 1682 will come back 75 years later. And this is the moment when you might say a modern account of the solar system becomes complete the whole thing becomes governed by a single set of physical laws, Newton's law of gravity. The sun at the center controls the movements of the planets, the comets, and any other object within the vicinity. And it's the beginning of a modern understanding of the place of the sun within what we would now call a solar system. had seen that Venus had phases and therefore the Ptolemaic system couldn't hold it up. Why, 20 years later, the Inquisition was so tough on Galileo uh, for the dialogue of the two worlds? Well, the answer is simple, because there's an alternative. There's, there's Tycho. And Tycho does everything that the mathematicians want a mathematical system of the cosmos to do. And he fits with traditional Aristotelian physics. And so the argument that's made to Galileo is you can never prove that Copernicus is right and Tycho is wrong because there's never going to be a measurement which enables you to distinguish between the two systems. So, so, so the Catholic Church had abandoned the Ptolemaic system? The Catholic Church, yes. And, and Galileo is very clear, in fact, if you read carefully what he says in, in, in the dialogue concerning the two chief systems, he knows he's arguing against Tycho Brahe, not Ptolemy. Galileo does this slate of hand. He calls Tycho, the Tychonic system Ptolemaic. And he calls the Tychonic system Ptolemaic because it still has the Earth at the center. And it's therefore, he thinks, just a, a variation on Ptolemy. As far as people like the Jesuits are concerned, it's not. It's a new system. So he, everybody understands. And Galileo writes this for length to, uh, in letters of the early 1630s. Everyone understands. Ptolemaic system's dead. It's now Tycho versus Copernicus. The question is, could you ever find evidence that enable you to show that Tycho was wrong and Copernicus was right? The evidence would be parallax movement of the stars in the heavens, for example. When they look for that evidence, they can't find it. Another thing that would have shown it, of course, the movement, Galileo thinks so you can prove that the Earth is moving because of the tides. N nobody is convinced by this argument. His friend Baliani, in order to get Galileo's argument to work, actually has to make the Earth go in orbit around the moon, which is not entirely a persuasive line of but, argument. But the phases of Venus is totally un un uncontroversial. It shows that Venus goes around the sun. Yeah, it shows that Venus goes around the sun. But uh, 
one thing that would have shown the Earth is moving, moving is Foucault's pendulum. And actually, Galileo's disciple, um, blocking on his name, uh, but one of Galileo's disciples with doing pendulum experiments, because Galileo had done pendulum experiments, sees the movement that we now call Foucault's pendulum, which is caused by the movement of the Earth, doesn't understand what it is. So, in principle, they could have found evidence of the movement of the Earth that might have been convincing, but they didn't. An orbit originally is the track left in earth, sand, or whatever by a wheel as it turns, or the, 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 the circle around where the eye is. And it's Kepler who says, let's take this word and transfer it to the heavens. As far as medieval philosophy is concerned, the planets are carried around in spheres that are invisible to us that are, but that are solid. That claim is refuted, if I can use the word refuted, by Tycho Brahe, because Tycho Brahe shows that the comets must be traveling through those spheres. And that consequently, if they're not bumping into them and bouncing off them, they don't exist. And Tycho Brahe needs to believe that. He discovered, comes to this conclusion in 1577. He doesn't publish his new system until 1588, because in Tycho's system, if you look at it again, there it is. In Tycho's system, the orbit of Mars cuts through, whoops, the orbit of Mars cuts through the orbit of the sun around the Earth. And so Tycho's system requires there not to be physical spheres. After any Tychonic astronomer, therefore, rejects the notion of physical spheres. After 1588, even Bellarmine, who leads the opposition to Galileo in 1616, says oh, the planets move like fish in the sea. There's no physical spheres carrying them. So after that, by and large, people accept the physical spheres don't exist, and the Tychonic system is based upon the rejection of the physical spheres. The puzzling question is whether Copernicus believed still in physical spheres. And an argument is, well, he did. He uses the word orbs all the time. Actually, if you go and look at Kepler, Kepler uses the word orbs all the time. And he does it because it's just a conventional word that astronomers use, and, it, and making up new words all the time is hard work, and the danger is you lose your, your readers. So the fact that Copernicus uses the word orbs, I think clearly doesn't mean he believes in them. Because if it did, then Kepler would have believed in them, and Kepler clearly doesn't. So you can't argue, I think, from Copernicus' vocabulary to conclude that he believes in physical orbs. I think the question of what Copernicus believes about orbs is just that he doesn't want you to know what he believes. He's actually quite unspecific on the subject. Yeah. It, Kepler, Kepler comes up with it. And Kepler comes up with it to, to, to have these non-circular movements. They're, they are orbits. <laughs> These have to do with the relationship between the Earth and the solar system and the rest of the, the cosmos. Let's put that aside for the moment. It's just intrinsically the solar system itself. The, dis the debate, for example, between uh, Tycho Brahe and Copernicus is really kinematical. It depends on where you put the system of coordinates. Do you put the sun at rest in your system of coordinates, or do you put the Earth at rest? And from the point of view of theories of motion, it doesn't really make any what you have to have is what Copernicus was looking for. That's, I think, a part of Kepler, and what later Newton provided is a theory of the 
a distinction between real and apparent motion, which has to do with making a distinction between basically natural motions and forced motions. That's essentially what Newton provided. And what Newton shows in his dynamics and his theory of gravity is that even quite apart from issues concerning our relationship with distant stars, the solar system itself, its center of gravity must be moving commercially. Or it means that you consider it to be a rest. Where is that center of gravity? Very, very close to the sun. That's what makes the Copernican system work perfectly correct. But without this distinction that Newton introduced between inertial motions and forced motions, and having a theory of the gravitational interaction, the debate between, between Tycho Brahe and Copernicus looks nearly thematical, nearly a question yeah. of description. So there's a sense at that time yeah, and I mean, a great astronomer, Cassini, is still a Tychonic astronomer in the 1680s and doing the most beautiful work on uh, the orbits of the, of, the pan of the moons of Jupiter, for example, and on the paths of comets. I mean, you can be absolutely in the front rank of astronomy in the 1680s and be a Tychonic astronomer. If I'm honest to defend, I'm not in the business of defending the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church, by the 1720s, has abandoned the Tychonic system simply on the basis that Newton is clearly right, and if Newton is right, Copernicus is right. And the Catholic Church, once Newtonianism has established itself, becomes Copernican in its astronomy. And, and there's a perfectly good grounds for saying that up until that point, it's a, the argument is moot, and after Newton, once, you, once, Newton, once people have understood Newton and agreed he's right, after Newton, the argument isn't moot anymore. Uh, you, you said that uh, Copernicus probably or possibly didn't believe in the existence of these gigantic spheres that, that uh, moved and its around the moon, and Tycho Brahe definitely couldn't have done. So what did they think instead? I mean, why did it have to wait for Kepler to come along uh, before anybody thought of the idea of forces moving these things around? Uh, I mean, what, what did people think, given that, that they didn't believe in the spheres anymore? And well, it, 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 well, wait, it had to wait 60, 70 years between Copernicus and Kepler. It's a, it's a good question, but the uh, part of the answer, I think, is that we have a restricted notion of the range of possible intelligent answers. One intelligent answer is that the planets themselves are intelligent that they're governed by intelligences, that they move upon the courses that they move because they, as it were, direct themselves. One of the answers to Galileo that's produced when he senses it is, but don't you understand that there are angels governing the movements of the planets? So Kepler's perfectly prepared to accept in principle that the planets may be governed by intelligences. The question then would be, how would the intelligence steer? What roadmap would it have? How would it know where it was in space? And he says, that's, you can't make sense of this in those terms. The crucial thing that makes the difference between Kepler and everyone before him is Kepler has William Gilbert's work on magnetism. And William Gilbert's work, on ma Gilbert's work on magnetism shows the way in which magnets act over a distance. And they therefore give you a notional force and the ways in which a notional force might act over a distance, which you can then say, well, we don't know what this force is, but let's think it's a bit like magnetism. And then this is what it would do. So Kepler has a, a, a physical model in mind and the physical model is magnetism, and that physical model, Gilbert publishes in 1600, that physical model isn't there before 1600. And as soon as it comes out, and Kepler publishes the Astronomy and Nova in 1607, a lot of work goes into that. 1600 to 1607 is amazingly fast. Gilbert transforms what you can do by giving you a model of how you might think physically about action over a distance. And that's the, still the model that Wren and Hooke and people are using in the 1660s and 1670s as they try and talk about gravitational forces before Newton. Uh, they're using uh, magnetism as their model of how gravitational forces might operate. So Gilbert, is, Gilbert knows, Gilbert believes he's going to transform astronomy. And Gilbert writes a long manuscript on, on the universe which is published after his death. Gilbert thinks he's going to transform astronomy by showing that a magnetic Earth 
would naturally rotate and that this would prove that Copernicus was right. Can't get it to do it. Can't do the experiment that will show this. But he does transform astronomy by providing a, a, a physical model for action over a distance. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, yeah, we'll let you follow into the quick follow-up. Yeah, okay. is, is it also <coughs> fair to say that, that Kepler was the first person to notice that the, the further out you go from the sun, the slower the planets are moving, and therefore it's more plausible that, that it's something to do with the sun rather than something yes. to do with the planet? Yes. Yes, and, and Kepler's model provides for the planet as it approaches the sun to speed up and slow down as it moves away from the sun. And all of this, these are physical, physically explicable in, in using magnetism as a model of how it might work. The forces will vary depending upon how close you are to the sun. And in that sense, Kepler's model works beautifully. Uh, it, he just doesn't know how to explain what it is. He doesn't do what Newton does, which is crucial to show the same forces are at work on Earth as in the heavens. Um, which is the, the gap, in the great gap in the argument until Newton. Okay, uh, last row. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very I think you said when they realized the Earth was spherical. <coughs> yeah. and, and they all know the Earth. This, uh, well, time is running out. Crudely speaking, they all know that the Earth is spherical. All of Ptolemaic classical astronomy. The notion that the Earth is flat doesn't exist. The church is re resistant to, to Galileo and through Galileo to Copernicus because the church teaches a theology which is grounded in Aristotelian philosophy. And crucially, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation can only be articulated in Aristotelian terms. If Copernicus is right and if Galileo is right, Aristotle is wrong. And Aristotle's physics, not just his astronomy, but it also his physics is wrong. And, and that's problematic for the church because Aristotle and Christianity since Aquinas have been so intermingled that the notion that you can tear them apart is un intolerable. So that, that's where the problem is. The problem is that it is not a theological problem, really. Galileo says it's not a theological problem. He's got lovely arguments to show that Augustine, you follow Augustine, understand Augustine, you see that these are not theological issues. Yet they're not but they're philosophical issues and the philosophy is attached to the theology and in such a way that separating them is difficult and painful. The church says we don't need to. We've got Tycho Brahe. Galileo's a nuisance. He should be told to shut up. Yes. Yes. Uh, Copernicus gets rid of five big epicycles. And in that sense, he simplifies the system. In his detailed maths, he reintroduces all sorts of complexities. And I think um, that's, that's certainly true. Copernicus has other gains. One of the other gains is that Copernicus's system, centered on the sun, has a fixed order for the planets. The Ptolemaic system, I said, in the Ptolemaic system, nobody can decide whether Venus is closer to the Earth than the sun or further than the Earth from the sun. <coughs> the system doesn't tell you where it is. In the Copernican system, the relationship between the planets is determined mathematically by the system. And Copernicus says, look, my system explains more than his system. That makes it a superior explanation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Where's the, where does this affect Mesolipsis get built into the type 5 and the Copernican system? You said in the 1640s there's still a debate between these two models. Are our elliptic part of those models, or are they still exercising these systems? Um, <coughs> I've just said you have to be careful about the language people use. But my impression about Cassini, I'm not an expert on Cassini. Cassini talks about epicycles. So I think that Cassini does not accept Kepler's ellipses. Um, I think Cassini is still working with the, what you might call a classical cyclonic system, where there are uh, cycles and epicycles, uh, but there are no fixed orbs. Uh, so in that sense, Kepler's system, I think, is only adopted by Copernicans. And only Copernicans are willing to make this move to, th to non-circular movement in the heavens. But I'm saying this very, very cautiously because I may be wrong. Okay, uh, okay there, was, there was one more question just at the very middle of that. Uh, beside, the, beside the picture, do you have a hand up? Yep, okay. And that is, that's, that's the last question for now. Um, uh, they, they assume the sun is in some sense fiery. They assume, therefore, that in some sense it must be burning something. Newton goes on to suggest that maybe comets fall into the sun and this provides new fuel for the sun, because otherwise why doesn't it burn out? Um, but they've gotten, I mean, these are metaphorical models for what the sun might be doing or how it might be functioning. The, the crucial thing about sunspots for Galileo, and the reason why he, uh, I think, understands from the beginning that they're important but doesn't publish on them, is precisely that he doesn't know what they are. But he does know one thing about them, which is that this is a heavenly body, the sun, which is not staying the same over time. Now, he's already said there are mountains on the moon. It's not a perfect sphere. According to their students, it's ought to be a perfect sphere. But it stays the same over time. Here is a heavenly body which is altering over time. And that's absolutely contrary to Aristotelian notions of what the heavenly body should be like. So it's a wonderful discovery, but he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know how he even to describe it. So I think this is why he holds back and lets Shiner come in first. Doesn't intend to let Shiner come in first, but Shiner comes in first and tries to fit it into an, a model where the sunspots are, in fact, satellites of some sort. And Galileo says, no, that won't work. But he, the only example he can give is clouds. So that in that sense, he simply has to say, well, let's imagine, metaphorically, that it's a bit like the Earth, which he knows it's not. No, no, they know it's spherical. Yeah, they're convinced. I mean, the, the whole Ptolemaic system is based upon the notion that all of the heavenly bodies are spherical. The question then is, is uh, I think Kepler does that. I think Kepler produces a, a period for the rotation of the sun. Um, I mean, the question is, are, is the sun going around or are the spots going around the sun? But I think Kepler argue, argue, argues that one of the fact factors is that the, the sun is going around. And I think he produces a, a period for the rotation of the sun. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Wood.